Thanks, Mike. As, um, as we begin this morning, I need to give you another word of thanks that I promised I would do this morning as I started, and that's from uh, Paul and Delia Over, who are our speakers last weekend and our Go Weekend. They just wanted me to say thank you for how warmly that you welcomed them and how much you opened your arms uh, to them, and they just wanted me to express that. And also from Paul. Paul went through a very difficult transition the week before as he said goodbye to a church in a place where he'd ministered for almost 18 years. And, and he was transitioning into a new role that he has in Latin America. And, and we commissioned him. Uh, we prayed for him much like he prayed for me this morning. And he just wanted me to express how much that meant to him and how significant that was to him to have a group of people that would pray for him as he began his new role and his new calling that God had put on his life in Latin America. So I want to just again say thank you for embracing them and, and for the great weekend that we had last weekend. And so now we're, we're kind of back where we, we were in our series. We took a one-week break with Dr. Delia and we've been talking about balance. And, and uh, so we're going to continue on that series that, uh, that we had started in September. And we're going to talk about it this week. And then next week, Pastor Chris will wrap up the series the last Sunday in October, I have a friend from Indianapolis that's going to be coming and, and speaking. His name is Shane, and he's going to be telling the story of the John Wesley Free Methodist Church and how they have gone through a transformational process and how they have engaged their local community in some really unique things that they've done and some really cool stuff that they've done. And I heard Shane speak this summer, and as soon as he got done, I made a beeline to him and I said, Shane, would you ever come up and... And, and share your story at Clarkson. He said, absolutely. And so he's going to share his story. And, and um, I really want to encourage you to welcome him on that Sunday and embrace a message and the, the story of what God has done in, in the city of Indianapolis. And, and truly why I want him to come, because I think we can wrap our arms around some of the exact same ideas that they have used to reach their local community. And we can do it right here at Clarkson as well. And so I think it's really cool for us to, to hear that story. And then in November... I don't know how this is going to work because, Chris, you're going to have a mic and I'm going to have a mic both at the same time. And Pastor Chris and I are going to be team preaching and we're going to be talking about the importance of spiritual development in every one of our lives and what spiritual development means, what it looks like, what we have to do to develop it, how we do that as a body, as a big body, and how we do that in, in smaller units of our body and really how we don't have a, a choice it's not a choice, it's a mandate, but how do we structure that and how do we do it and what does God's word have to say about it? And we've laid out the messages and, man, I'm ready to go. So change topics this morning, let's go right now. Ready? Yeah. Give me a mic. I'll give you a mic, okay, all right. So, so we'll launch on that in October. So, you know, we've been in this series on balance and, and as Chris gave the introduction in my prayer time, that was really neat, Chris, thank you. Um, you know, we, we have to have that we have to have that reference point. And, and we said the very first week, we, we have to know where our money goes and we have, to, we have to track that. And we said we have to make constant corrections. We have to make changes. We have to make changes as life goes because life is a journey. And then we said that we had to have a goal. We had to have a focus. And obviously the focus of our lives as followers of Jesus should be to design our life and to use our life so that we can follow Jesus and we can do what God's will is in every one of our, our lives. And so this morning we're going to continue. And this morning I have this music stand with all these papers on it for a reason up here because I want to talk this morning about a value of society and a value that God says we should have as his followers. And I'm going to be upfront with you and honest this morning as I begin. The value that God has and the value that our society has man, they're, they just buck heads. I mean, they go full bore right into each other. They're polar opposites. And so we're going to have to deal with that because all of us do. And that's the whole issue and the whole idea in our lives of, of discontentment, being discontented with what we have. And discontentment is, is pretty simple. I mean, it's, it, it's just that dissatisfaction with what I have because our culture is so keen on doing this. I mean, I picked up the Oakland Press this morning, and it was amazing to me. I mean, you know this. The Sunday paper, this is the ads, okay? This is the news section. But, I, you know, I noticed in the news section that, like, every section, if you open it up, has full-page ads that have nothing to do with the news. So if I had time this morning and I cut all these sections out of the paper, most of the paper would be to tell me that my life isn't good enough. 
I mean, really, I mean, I don't have these in any certain order. I just put these ads here. The very first one, I know that I'm insignificant and insecure in my home because we have a 21-inch TV that we've had forever. And the very first ad is for a 60-inch LED HD t smart TV that I can do Facebook and Twitter and everything on while I'm watching TV. Why you would want to do that while you're watching TV, I don't have any idea, but, but I know that mine isn't good enough. So, so because I'm aware, and awareness is part of this dissatisfaction, awareness is part of this, I, I don't have enough. I mean, man, it's only 998 bucks. What a deal, okay? And then I find out that, you know, tomorrow's Columbus Day, and, you know, my printer, my laptop, you know, everything is just so out of date and so insignificant. I mean, I got to have this, right? And then I go out in the parking lot, and I see all these ads for pickups, and I don't know where it was in here, but there's an ad. It was only 218 bucks a month for a brand new pickup. And then I go out, and I look at my little white Ford Ranger, and it's got rust starting on top of the fender wells, and it's a 1995. I don't know why it's starting to rust now. It hasn't all these years, but it's finally starting to rust. And I was really hoping I could drive that baby till it was 25 years old and I could put historic plates on it and say, see, I really do drive an antique. Um, and, and maybe I will, but by that time, there probably won't be any back end on it from the rust. But, you know, I, I look at that and I'm dissatisfied because I see these pictures of these brand new deals and, man, I... I I gotta have one of those. I mean, obviously, I, I have to have it in my life. I mean, I, I've gotta have it. And this, this kind of dissatisfaction, I mean, it drives my decisions. It drives what I do. I mean, I have a, an iPhone. My phone's a little bit better than Pastor Chris's. I mean, he's got <laughs> something else. I'd, I don't know what, what that crazy thing is. It doesn't even fit in his pocket that he's got. But anyway, whatever it is, you know, and I thought my iPhone was wonderful, Except mine's a 4S, and now they come out with this 5S, and so obviously mine isn't good enough, and I've got to get a new one. I was talking to somebody the other day, and just so that, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not like totally biased, although mainly biased. Um, my wife has a Galaxy Samsung, and, but hers is a, I don't know, what is hers, Chris, a 3? Okay. And I was talking to somebody, and I said, I think she has an S3, and they said, she doesn't have the 4? <laughs> said, no. And it was like when they said, but she doesn't have... Four? It was like, I haven't taken care of my wife. I mean, as a husband, I haven't fulfilled my duty to embrace her and to take care of her because as a husband, I allow her to have a Galaxy S3 instead of a, is it S4 or 5 or what is it? I don't know, 6, 4? Okay, whatever. Okay, and I don't have that newest thing. And so since I don't have that newest thing, I'm incomplete in how I take care of her. I mean, our society sells us and being aware of your discontentment, being aware of, of this thing that drives us, being aware, and because we're aware of this and because we're discontent, it drives us to take our resources and pursue this lifestyle, pursue this stuff, pursue having these things, because if I don't have them, my life will not be complete. And then we open God's Word and we see something and we see a message that quite frankly is pretty inconsistent with a number at the end of your phone. And so we have to deal with that. We have to say, wait a minute, there's this, a decision that I'm going to have to make and a decision that you're going to have to make as a follower of Jesus and we're going to have to decide how we live our life. And I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles or if you don't, on the outline that was passed out today, on the back, there's 1 Timothy beginning in chapter 6. We're going we're gonna to start looking. And, and in the middle of this, this passage is a very familiar verse that I'm going to be honest with you. It just grinds me sometimes because it's taken out of context. And there's all kinds of stuff it's twisted to say that it really doesn't say because it's taken out of the context of the passage. And so we're going to look at this word, verse that's used so often in the context in which it was given and help us to understand this whole deal. But, but let's get right into this and, and let's see what this has to do with this awareness and this dissatisfaction, this discontentment, because we're only dissatisfied and discontent when we're aware. If we don't know something is out there that's different, then we don't want it. But as soon as we become aware, we have to have it because that's our culture that we live in. Well, let's see what God says. Verse 6. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by, what's that last word? Oh, wait a minute. 
contentment. None of these stuff is about contentment. I mean, how many of you go out, I shouldn't admit this, but I do, I will, okay? How many of you go out on Thanksgiving morning if you don't take the paper just so you can buy the paper? Anybody do that? I do. Okay, am I the only weird one that wants to know what the ads are? Or maybe you look online and you get the Black Friday, you know, you Google Black Friday ads ahead of time, and so a bunch of you are going, yep. So you know all the ads that are coming. You know why they do that? So that you can be discontent with what you have. And if you're discontent, you become aware, and they make these shiny, glossy ads so that you're aware of what you don't have. And when you become aware of what you don't have, then you need what you don't have. You're discontent. And then I read God's Word, and God's Word says godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Being satisfied. Now, I'm not talking about living, you know, living with a ringer washing machine. You know, I mean, uh, don't take this too far, okay? But I mean, just, just getting something because I've got to have it. I mean, getting something because there's something new or getting something because somebody else has it, so I have to have it. I mean, that's the epitome. That's the definition of discontentment. And then I read God's Word, and it says, godliness is a means of great gain, Well, there's something that can be gained here. I'm not sure what it is yet because I'm just starting to read verse 6, but it's accompanied by this contentment. So somehow there's an interplay here. Somehow I'm going to learn something from God's Word that has to do with contentment. Somehow that's going to give me a gain. And somehow contentment and gaining this, whatever it is I'm supposed to gain, is somehow linked with being a godly person. So, so I know that. I can draw those conclusions. I, I don't know what those conclusions are yet, but, but I can draw them from verse 6. So let's go on to verse 7. It says, For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. I um, want to encourage you when you come to church on Sunday morning, but i got to say it this morning, you're all going to die. And when you die, you're not going to be able to take some, anything with you. Okay? And all that stuff, all this awareness stuff, all this stuff that you had to have, I mean, I don't know where it is. Here it is. Oh, my word. This is an awesome picture. Okay? All right. This is, man, I saw this, and I thought, whoa, this is a good ad. So I'll keep that one. Okay? Keep that one right there. All right? Um, and and, and, and we, we, we see these things, and, and we want to have them, but then I realize in a few years, it's not going to matter. My dad is almost 90 years old. We just moved my mom and dad from their home uh, about a year and two or three months ago now. My dad had a pole barn. Do you know what it's like for an 89 year old guy to have a pole barn? Maybe you don't know what it's like. You know what it's like for my dad to have a pole barn? I mean, you couldn't walk in the upstairs of my dad's pole barn. Now, he had everything organized. He knew where he got everything, and he knew what it did, and he knew when he used it. Now, some of the stuff he hadn't used since 1946, but he had it, okay? And then their house, I mean, a -a two-and-a-half-car garage in their basement, and their upstairs filled with stuff that was so important to them. And then they move into a 900-square-foot condominium with about a -a one-and-a-half-car garage, and I had to sit my dad down, And it was really uncomfortable because then all of a sudden the son had to be the father. And I had to say, Dad, you got to get rid of your stuff. And Dad, I don't want your stuff. And my sister Pam, she doesn't want your stuff. And my kids, they don't want your stuff. And Dad, I know your stuff is everything to you because it has so many great memories. But Dad, if you died today... We would bring a dumpster in and we would fill it. So, Dad, you got to get rid of your stuff because we don't want it. Now, that was a very difficult discussion to have with my dad, but I had to be honest with him. And even after that, I was so proud because I'd go to his house on garbage day and there'd be a pile of garbage out in front of his house. I'd go, yes! And then I would go in and Don and I had this pack. Whatever he gave us, we would keep and we would throw away at our house. Okay? So he'd say, but I got these... I got this pile that I know you would want. For instance, I go into the garage and he has seven weed sprayers, you know, the little pump-up kind. And he said, they all work, so I couldn't throw them away and I knew you'd want them. And what do I say? Okay, Dad, I'll take them. Put them in the back of the truck. Throw them in the back of the truck, go home, garbage day, guess what's out in front of my garbage? 
Seven weed sprayers, okay? That's what's going to happen to all your stuff. Hate to tell you, all your stuff is so valuable, someday you're going to die and your kids, your family, they're going to throw it out. It doesn't matter. It's, it's gone. And God is trying to tell us that there's something more important than all this stuff. There's something that we have that's, that's going to give us great gain. There's something here that's so treasured that it gives you godliness and it's not all this stuff and all the things that this represents. What is it? Well, let's go to verse 8, okay? This talks a little bit about our stuff. If, if we have food and covering, now, I, I want to just ask you, today, if it was, it's a beautiful day outside. I'm glad it's not raining, but for my sermon illustration, I kind of wish it was, but I'm glad it's not, okay? But if it was pouring down rain this morning and you left this church, could you get in some form of transportation and go to some place that you could spend the night and have a roof over your head so that you didn't have to sleep out in the rain overnight. I mean, do you guys have a place to go that you can stay out of the rain? Okay. I mean, this is a dumb question to ask, but there's places that people don't have this, but do you have clothes to wear? I mean, more than just the set that you're wearing this morning. Do you have another set of clothes, even if it's that old gritty pair of jeans and the old t-shirt. I mean, I love wearing that, but my wife won't let me wear it in public, that kind of clothes. Or maybe you got another pair. You, you got another set of clothes at home? Anybody? Okay. Do you have some food to eat? Okay. You're wealthy. You're rich. You're extraordinarily gifted. Now, you may not think so, but let's, let's continue to read what God said. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. Really? Really? Just that? Food and covering and I'm supposed to be content? Come on, God. I mean, have you seen the ads today? There's some awesome buys in there. Come on. Food and clothing and I'm content? What's that about? Verse 9, but those who want to get rich. Now, now, let me just stop right there. Let's give a biblical definition of rich. If you have food and covering, you're rich. All right? Now, now it's not a comparison game. It's not, well, they have more. No, 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 no. If you have food and covering, you're rich. And it's not wrong to be rich. It's not wrong to amass great amounts of wealth. It's not wrong to have those financial resources. Okay? But understand, if you are rich, which all of us here fall into the biblical definition of being rich, then there's something that's going to happen to us. And there's something that's going to happen against us. And God's Word says it. And here's what it says. But those who want to get rich, those who want to have more than just this covering and, and, and this food, I mean, that's me. I, I fall into that. I want to have more for my kids than just a set of clothes and some food in a place to hang out with in case it rains. I mean, I want to have more than that for my children. I want to have more than that for my family. I want to have more than that for my wife. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that desire, but I understand if I have that desire, as I think probably all of us do, that we're going to fall into a temptation. Now, temptation isn't wrong in itself. Jesus was tempted. But we have to understand we're going to have a temptation that's unique to people who have stuff. And it's unique to people who are aware that they need more stuff. And it's unique to people who have the resources to buy stuff they really don't need. It's unique to people that can buy stuff and put it in their house and then not use it for years and say, I have it. I hated preaching this message to my wife who was sitting right down here for service. And she kept smiling at me because we have been having this ongoing discussion because I kept a lot of my treasures when we moved and they're out in our garage and my wife has been saying you need to get rid of them. And so after I preached this message, she came up and she said, Honey, I think you need to get rid of your stuff. <laughs> and I said, I think you need to go down and teach the children. Okay? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it goes both those ways, you know? So, so this is to us. There's a temptation here. And, and look what that temptation does. This is, this is where it gets really serious. Because this is a temptation that will take us who want to be rich and it'll be a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. 
So it's a warning. All of us who have this accumulation and want this stuff and want this things that we have, there's this deal here, there's this instruction, there's this temptation. And if we give in to that temptation, it's going to result in ruin and destruction in our lives. So then I say, okay, what is it? What is that ruin and destruction? What is that deal that's going gonna, that's gonna to hurt me? What is this? Temp so I'm aware, if you're aware of the temptation, then you can do things to avoid the temptation, to put it off, to, to deal with the temptation. Okay, verse 10. This is the verse that's taken out of context. Understand, we've given you all that context so that we can get to verse 10. Many times people start out in verse 10 and they, they, they twist it to where it's not meant to be. Okay? For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Okay? There's something here. There's a desire. There's a heart issue here. Okay, there's this temptation, and then it follows with this. So when you look at this and you study it, it's this temptation to use my money and use my resources in a way in which I obtain all the desires that I'm aware of. And I obtain these things that I can see and I get and I replace and I get and I replace and I get and I replace and I get and I replace. And all of a sudden I have a love for getting and I have a love for replacing. And if I become sold out to that love of getting and replacing and getting and replacing and spending and having, then all of a sudden that love is going to epix. That love is going to go over. That love is going to exceed my commitment and my surrender to Jesus Christ. Money isn't bad. It's what we do with it. It's how we use it. Money is nothing. It's a piece of paper. But it's the attitudes that we bring behind it. Let's go on and see what else it says. It says, and some by longing for it. I mean, we long for it so that we can have all of the stuff that's in here. We long for it so that we can have a great time this afternoon at Dick's Sporting Goods. And that's a great buying shotgun shells. Anyway, okay, so we long for it so we can have this. And then look what it says. Look at what the results. Here's the results of that temptation. And some for longing for it have wandered away from their faith. Wow. Wow. I actually can wander away from my faith in God because of stuff? Are you kidding me? And pierce themselves with many grief. Verse 11. So what do we do about that? It says, but flee from these things, you man of God. Don't flee from proper management of money. Don't flee from, you know, we've talked about saving and, and good debt and bad debt and, you know, making sure you have the right insurances and all those kind of things. I mean, all of those proper financial tools, it's not that you just ignore all that stuff, but you flee from this attitude. You flee from this thing that says, I'm discontent, I'm dissatisfied, I'm aware of my dissatisfaction, I'm rich, so I have the tools to get rid of my dissatisfaction, so I'll in fact medicate myself with my money and my things and my stuff, and I'll live a lifestyle of stuff medication. No, flee from that stuff. Now when it says, you man of God, women at don't think it just talking about men. This is like humankind here, okay? This is Bible language for you people that are humans, okay? And pursue righteous, and here's what we do. Pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith and take hold of the eternal life which you were called and you made good the confession in the presence of of many witnesses. You see, what he's saying here, flee from this because there's a different way to live. You see, there's two ways to live. I mean, you could live in this American culturalized deal of money and you can pursue this stuff and you can buy into being dissatisfied and you can buy into being discontent and you can be aware and you can always pursue the newest of everything. And sometimes... That can be at the cost of pursuing what God wants you to pursue. And God says, I'm giving you an invitation to pursue eternal life. I'm giving you an invitation 
to pursue godliness. I'm giving you an invitation to pursue faith. I'm giving you an invitation to pursue courage. I'm giving you an invitation to pursue eternal things because all of the stuff of this world is stuff and when you die, it's gone and somebody else will throw it away because it only means something to you. And God says, I want to give you an invitation. An invitation to invest this life which all of us have that if we're lucky is 70, 80, 90 years and then it's gone. What are you going to do with that time to build the kingdom, to build eternity? Timothy is saying when you invest in those things that build eternity, that's true satisfaction. That's true contentment. As long as you pursue the newest and the greatest and the best and the awesomeness of everything, there'll always be dissatisfaction. Because you weren't made for that. You were made in the image of Jesus to pursue Jesus and all that Jesus has for you. And you were to pursue eternity. And you were to pursue the kingdom of God. That's how you were made. You were made in the image of God the Father who created the heaven and the earth to pursue his kingdom. It's no wonder we're dissatisfied with life when we don't pursue God's kingdom. Because we fall to temptation that says there's something better. And when we pursue something better, we always fall and we're always dissatisfied. So what do we do? What's the solution to this deal? Well, it's really cool that I don't have to give you the solution. It's really neat that God's word gives a solution. Go down to verse 17 and in 1 Timothy 6, it says, Instruct those who are rich. Okay, who's rich? Who's rich? We all are, okay? I'm rich. You're rich. We're all rich. Everybody here is rich because we have food and some place to go. We're rich. Okay, so that's us. So instruct those who are rich. So this is God's word, not just for the first century church. This is God's word for you. Isn't it cool how God's word can speak to me today just like it spoke to his church centuries ago? This is, this is awesome. This is what I love about eternal stuff. It's eternal, okay? Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. All of the stuff that surrounds me is pretty uncertain. I can do the best job I can do in my investments, and I've tried to do that. I mean, we've had an investment advisor, and he's helped us, and he's worked with us, and he's got us set up with, you know, he's got us set up with our investments and our, our retirement and our insurance, and, and, and we've got stuff coming out every month to go into all those little pockets, and he's got us all set up. And I think we're secure. I mean, I assume we are, but there's no guarantee. No guarantee. There is a guarantee on something, though. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know ma no matter what happens in this life, I may end this life just the way I planned it with wealth to give away at the end of life. But it may not end up that way. I, I don't know. That's my plan, but that may not work out that way. But I do know something. When this life ends and I die, I'm going to spend eternity with my Savior in the kingdom of heaven. So it makes sense to me if I'm going to spend eternity in a place, then I should invest my life in the values of that place. I mean, that just kind of makes sense to me. And that's what he's saying. Fix our hope under the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. So it's not wrong to have any of these things. It's wrong when these things take the place of God. He gives us these things to enjoy. He gives us our life to enjoy. We should thank him every day. God, thank you that I'm among the rich in this world. I don't know why. I don't understand it. I don't know why you chose me, but God, thank you. And Lord, help me to use your riches. It's not my riches. It's his to build your kingdom. And then he goes on, instruct them. Oh, here we go. Here's what we're supposed to do. All right? Instruct them to do good. Okay? Now, not to just go out in our society and be do-gooders, but again, do good because we're residents, we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We do good in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We do good at Clarkston Senior Center and all of those who volunteered there, thank you. You're doing good not because you have to do good. You're doing good because 
you're going to serve in the name of Jesus Christ. Those of you who, who partner with Gift for All God's Children for Christmas gifts this year, you're going to do good. But don't just get Christmas gifts for kids because they need them. Get Christmas gifts for kids because you're a follower of Jesus. And Jesus has asked us to do that. I mean, those of you who pack backpacks for kids so they can have food during the weekend and, and, and this place on Wednesday night gets kind of crazy with 650 backpacks being packed every week. That's going to be awesome, but don't do it just because we're going to want to do something good. Do it because we're followers of Jesus Christ and we want to embrace the mission, the eternal mission of Jesus Christ. When you tutor students at Renaissance High School, don't, don't just go to Renaissance High School because you think it's a good thing to do to help kids learn. Do it because you want to show them a life that's committed to Jesus and so that you want to build the kingdom in them. I mean, that's our privilege. In fact, I love what it says. Instruct them to do good, and then it says, comma, to be rich in good works. Now, if I'm rich in money, I got a lot of money. Okay, if you're rich in good works, you got a lot of things that you do. Be generous. That says something about my giving. My giving is, I mean, we talked a couple weeks ago about tithing, about that 10% that goes to the storehouse. Be generous goes beyond that. It's above that. It, it, it's a lifestyle. It's not just sharing our money. We do that. It's giving above that financially, but it's also giving above that with time and giving above that with effort and giving above that with your very life to those things that God has called you to do. And then what happens we store up for ourselves a treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Let me tell you a story of how this has worked in our life. Long ago when Don and I were first married, um, probably because of the influence of, of my parents and Don's parents, because we were fortunate enough, both of us, to grow up in homes that modeled um, that modeled giving and modeled the priority of, of giving. Not only did both our parents, you know, model the, the, the kind of the, the model of tithing, and we always just thought everybody did it because our parents did it. I mean, when you're a little kid growing up, you just, if your parents do it, you think everybody does it. And so we did that. We also saw parents that gave. And when Don and I got married, we got married, and then we moved to, to Wilmore, Kentucky, and we were on our own. You know, our first house was a, was a 12 by 55 uh, mobile home that was built in 1961. It was an awesome place to live uh, for a short time. And, uh, and, and so, but while we were there in our mobile home, we said, you know what? We're going to honor God first with everything that comes in. Our time, our money, our energies, our life, our effort. And then what's left over, we're going to invest for our future and then we're going to spend the rest. And we're just going to live our life with that kind of lifestyle. And so we just said, you know, when God calls us to give, to be generous, we want to have space in our life so we could do that. And in my former church, I used to make at least two trips a year to Swaziland. And I'd spend about, oh, eight or nine weeks a year in Swaziland. And, and I met these two girls. Greg, you can put their pictures up there. Um, on one of my first trips, they didn't look, this, was, this picture was just taken a couple months ago. Um, but when I first met them, I mean, they were, they were really small couple girls and the the one on the on the bottom left is Lindo and and the one on the top is Cephas uh, I always get it messed up Cephasili and I can't say it quite right because you, her end of her name has a click and I can't my tongue doesn't make the click but anyway there's a click on the end of her name too she always laughs at me when I say it but but these two kids are from a mother whose husband died of AIDS and in the Swazi culture if your husband dies of AIDS, it puts a stigma on you and you won't ever get remarried again and you probably won't get a job. And her mother is a seamstress and she just kind of sells on the side, but she doesn't have a job. And I fell in love with these two kids because their house was right behind our church in Manzini, Swaziland. And so we had a child sponsorship like we do and, and with, with, our, uh, with our church. And so we signed up to sponsor these kids, 25 bucks a month, and, you know, get them their food and their clothes and their school tuition and all that. But these two girls had a lot more needs than that because of their family situation. And so we talked to, to the group we were working with with the sponsorship and all of that, and we set up a fund for them 
that, that Don and I have just said, you know what, we're going to say no to this stuff so that we can provide a good quality of life for these two girls. And we can't change the whole nation of Swaziland, but we can change these two lives. And so these two girls and their family, they always have food. Their rent's always paid. They always have money to buy coal for, for fire to, to keep their, their house warm. They always have clothes. And they always have transportation to go to the school so that they don't have to walk because it's pretty dangerous for a young girl to walk to school in the city. And we provide that as something that Don and I do because God has called us to be generous because we're rich and they're not. And I want to tell you, this gives me more satisfaction than any fishing or hunting or toy I could possibly imagine. And I love to fish and I love to hunt. But this is the real deal. This is the kingdom of God. This is changing lives. That's what we've been called to. And Timothy gives us an invitation. He says, don't sell out to the world. Don't hold your stuff as so precious, as so valuable, because it's all going to go away. Instead, invest yourself in lives. Invest yourself in people. And give and serve and be the church and the people the godly people, the Christ followers that Jesus has called you to be. Now, Mike's going to play, and I'm going to ask you two questions as he plays, and I'm just going to ask you to talk to God about these two questions, and really these two questions are the same question. They're just reworded different ways, so maybe it's just one question for those of you who are technical. But here's, a, here's a, the first question. What do you need to become more aware of? I mean, society makes us more aware of all the stuff we don't have. But maybe God wants you to be more aware of something in his kingdom that he has gifted you and only you to do or to resource. What is that thing that God is trying to get your attention, but because of the temptation of the world, you've tuned him out and you've shut your eyes and that need is waiting to be met. And that need is going to be met by you when you respond to God. What do you need to be more aware of? And then number two, what do you need to become less aware of? What do you need to say, it just doesn't matter? It doesn't matter if my phone's a three or a four or a five or pretty soon they'll have a six and a seven. It just doesn't matter. It, is, it, it doesn't matter what kind of car I drive. It, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's bow our heads and just let God talk to us for a little bit this morning. Lord, I pray that you decrease our dissatisfaction with the stuff of life and increase our dissatisfaction with being aware and wanting to know, desiring what you want us to do and what role you want us to play in the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. Lord, I close our service this morning in prayer. And Lord, I simply pray your words that you gave to us in your word, the Holy Bible. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. 
Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Jesus, help us to take hold of that which is life and help us to throw off all of that which brings death and discouragement and destruction in our lives. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.